Welcome, welcome all to this special webinar event in collaboration with Pendulum and Fullscript. I'm Amy Regan from Fullscript, and I am so glad that you've joined us today. A few housekeeping notes. Please place all questions you have in the Q&A box for a chance for them to be answered during the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent via email to all attendees and registrants. And there's a copy of the presentation slides in the handout section for you to download. Today, we are joined by Colleen Cutcliffe, PhD, Pendulum CEO, Dr. Alex Keller, ND, Fullscript's Medical Director, and Dr. Jeff Glad, MD, Fullscript's Chief Medical Officer. Welcome, everybody. Thanks, Amy. I do not see my... How do I change the slides? If you slide your mouse over the slides, does it pop up automatically? Oh, there it goes. Okay, I, I, I minimized too much. I was trying to do the Dr. Keller, I wanna see Colleen higher up uh, trick and I, I lost it. So, okay, let's get started. Um, so it, it's great to be back with, with Colleen. I mean, a Alex and I were just talking to her prior to kicking off here. The, the content here is, is really rich. It's obviously a, a really critical and, and very hot topic. So, so we're excited to bring it to you together. Um, let me give a little bit of the overview and where we're going to focus the webinar. So we'll start very briefly on the importance of healthy weight management, walk through some of the major therapy categories that are being used today. We'll, we'll dive deep then into the glucagon-like peptide 1, or otherwise known the rest of the webinar as GLP-1 introduction. Then we'll talk about the relationship between the digestive tract and GLP-1s. And after that will be a discussion of Pendulum, walking through their mission and their history as a company. Dr. Keller then is gonna jump in and discuss how Fullscript can help optimize your patient care around weight and metabolic health. And we'll finish with a live Q&A where we'll, cover, we'll try to cover as many questions as possible as we go through the webinar, because a lot of those questions are coming up you know, as, we're, as you're listening to the talk and going through the slides. So feel free to, to add those as, as we go. We'll try to pick the ones appropriate for that section, but at the end, we'll leave some time to kind of walk through as many as we can. So as we talk about healthy weight management, the issue is pretty obvious that this is a major health epidemic. Um, you know, in 2022, CDC data reported that 42% of American adults have obesity. And we know that one of the major complications of obesity is cardiometabolic disease, but it also has a significant impact on all cause, all cause mortality, increasing that by anywhere from 21 to 108%. There's an increase in certain types of cancer, like endometrial cancer, where that re relative uh, incidence increases 20% by every two units of BMI increase. And depression incidence is increased by up to 55%. As we talk about some of the traditional ways, you know, the common approaches that are being used for weight management, we've highlighted many of them here. I'm going to start in the upper right hand corner, knowing that the guidance and resources to support diet and lifestyle modification are table stakes, right? They're foundational, regardless of any other modalities that you or your patients choose. We have to make sure and provide the resources and education around diet and lifestyle modification. As we go counterclockwise to the slide, natural ingredients like adaptogenic herbs, B vitamins, green tea extract, omega-3s, protein powders, and fibers become important you know, uses both as primary ways to help support metabolism and, and weight management, but they're also becoming really important as you know, sort of uh, adjunctive therapies on top of some of these other therapies that you're seeing here in the slide. So then we have you know, bariatric procedures and some of the pharmaceuticals, you know, older options like appetite suppressants, lipase inhibitors, metformin, and of course the GLP-1 analog class of pharmaceuticals, which is getting a bulk of the attention when it comes to weight management. In that vein, though, we want to dive into the microbiome therapies, which are now showing promise. Most of us throughout our entire careers in this whole person healthcare world have focused on the microbiome. So it comes as no surprise that the gut holds so many keys to weight management as well. So with that, I wanna hand it off to Colleen to kind of take us through you know, the, the, the microbiome and the connection between the gut and, and GLP-1s. 
Thank you. Um, and I'll just reiterate that uh, super excited to be able to be here with uh, Jeff and Alex to talk to you guys about some of the new discoveries and tools that we have at our disposal to help people with metabolic syndrome. And thank you to everybody who's uh, joined the call today. Rather than having this be like a lecture series, we'd love for it to be interactive. So please put your questions and thoughts into the Q&A and we are definitely going to hit them. So um, very excited to hear what everybody's thinking about and, and where your mindset is um, as this field is sort of pretty rapidly evolving and, and changing. So um, as Jeff said, many people uh, here have become familiar with uh, GLP-1. It really stands for glucagon-like peptide one. This is a hormone that your body naturally produces um, and it plays a really important role in regulating blood glucose levels as well as appetite. So in blood glucose control, we know that it increases insulin and reduces glucagon. And on weight management, it helps to reduce appetite and increase satiety. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know is there's a really important role that the microbiome plays in stimulating GLP-1 production. And so um, it's really been over the last couple of years that you can see this spike in the popularity of GLP-1. So um, this plot is really just a, a, a Google search. And so you can see how many people are searching for the term GLP-1 over time. And in the last couple of years, you can see that that's that real rise in people knowing and, and being interested in what is GLP-1. And one of the most common things people talk about is the ability to quiet um, so-called food noise. And so a lot of us are walking around thinking about what food we're going to be eating uh, right after eating, what's the next meal I'm going to be eating. And there's just this constant chatter happening in people's heads, which has been dubbed food noise. And I just recently saw this statistic, which said that um, 80% of women are walking around with food guilt and 70% of men are walking around with food guilt. And it's associated with having these food cravings and then succumbing to those cravings. And so, oh man, I'd love to have a chocolate chip cookie. And then you eat the cookie. So you've you know made what you feel like is a terrible choice at that moment. And then you walk around with this guilt. And so um, you know, to Jeff's earlier slide, it's not just about then the impact on the metabolic syndrome. It's also the impact on the human psyche and your ability to sort of be able to, um, you know, feel good about the choices that you're making and what you're doing. And so really understanding the relationship between the gut and GLP-1 starts to become really important, especially when we think about those food cravings and sort of the mental state of mind. And so a lot of this work really uh, is premised in these fecal microbiome transplants, which um, if you don't know what those are, it's exactly what it sounds like. You're literally taking feces from one person and transplanting it in, into another person. And this is where all of your, uh, you know, 12 year old boy jokes can enter. What a shitty therapeutic. We certainly we can do better than this shit. But basically what these have been uh, able to show us is the power of the gut microbiome. And so in these cases, you're basically by putting the, you know, the stool from one person who's healthy into a person who's sick and seeing resolution of that disease, that's telling you that something in that, that stool, something in that microbiome is conferring a health benefit to the recipient. And there've been a variety of studies really showing that these fecal microbiome transplants can help to resolve metabolic syndrome symptoms around insulin and glucose um, and, and even uh, uh, food cravings. And so this early hallmark study that was done has been repeated many times over, but really introduced us to the idea that the microbiome can impact your metabolism. In this study, what they did on the, on the top row here is they took the microbiome from an obese woman, they put it into a thin mouse, and they saw that thin mouse become obese. They then took the microbiome from this thin woman, put it into an obese mouse, and they saw that obese mouse become thin. Then they took the microbiome from this, okay, now I'm going to try the, the drawing thing. They took the microbiome from this thin mouse, which got it from the thin woman, and put it into this obese mouse, which got its microbiome from the obese woman. And what they saw was that they were able to make that obese mouse thin again. Okay, don't judge me for my drawing skills. That's really not why uh, he, people keep me employed. But the point is that um, by just changing the microbiome, they were able to make these mice thin as well as obese. And I think the really compelling thing about this study is that the two women who donated the microbiomes are actually identical twins. And so genetically, they are the same. This is purely the microbiome that is changing the metabolism. And so when we think about nature versus nurture, this is really getting at that, that nurture part of that story. And so pendulum, one of the things that we've really been focused on is, okay, well, you have all these microbes that are sitting in your microbiome. How do they interact with each other? Can you create a map of a person's microbiome? And then can you start to understand where are they depleted? Where are they overstocked? And how does that actually impact the, the host and, and, and the health of the person that these microbes are living in? 
And just to fast forward uh, essentially almost a decade of work into one single slide here, um, this is a publication of a placebo-controlled double-blinded randomized trial in which we took people with type 2 diabetes and gave them a formulation of novel microbes that are designed to help them improve the way that their body metabolizes um, fibers and, and increases things like GLP-1, and we'll get more into the mechanism of action. And really what was shown in this publication is that uh, we are able to impact the the um, these people with type 2 diabetes. So just uh, really quickly, this is a three-arm trial. One arm is the placebo. One arm is a full formulation, WBF11, which contains a five-strain formula. And then the third arm is WBF10, which is a subset of the strains that are in WBF11. The population was 76 subjects across six different study sites in the U.S., and the key primary outcomes and secondary outcomes were looking at safety and tolerability. Um, these are strains that had not really been put into people before, so wanted to make sure that there was safety and tolerability measurements. Um, and then the two key uh, metabolic syndrome um, uh, diagnostic tools were the meal tolerance test and measuring the area under the curve after someone was given a, a meal. And then the second is measuring their HbA1c. Um, and then we also looked at uh, C-reactive protein. And so it's kind of the high level results here are, are on the uh, plot on the right. And what we were able to show is that compared to placebo, the formulation uh, in green there, the full formulation, was able to lower a A1C by 0 0.6 and lower postprandial glucose spikes by 33%. Um, the sub-formulation, the three-strain formulation, had some impact, but not as relevant and as large as the full formulation here. This is the first and still the only probiotic that has ever been shown to be able to lower A1C and blood glucose spikes in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, and so this is a really exciting, I think, time for all of us in the microbiome space to understand that by altering the microbiome, we can actually alter the disease state of an individual. Um, and so uh, just to get a little bit more into de the details of the incremental versus the um, the, the total uh, area under the curve, you can see that when you measure both the total as well as the incremental, that you see a significant improvement in the uh, area under the curve in those postprandial glucose spikes when people were given the full formulation. Um, we did further studies uh, in these individuals to really look at the mechanism of action. And um, one of the primary ways in which these strains are, are acting is through the production of the postbiotic butyrate. And so what we show in this publication is that you're able to see for the people who are on the formulation an increase in butyrate levels, both in the stool as well as in the plasma. And so maybe I'll, I'll pause there for a second to see if there are any questions we should be addressing. Uh, we just got one. Well, now there's a couple popping up, but the first one was, are you aware of any connection between GLP-1 and intermittent fasting? So um, maybe to answer that question, we'll sort of take one second step back and, and talk about kind of how GLP-1 gets triggered in the body when you eat food. So essentially, um, when you eat food, you have these 100 trillion microbes sitting in your microbiome. It's like a little factory and they are helping to metabolize that food and, and generate what we call products, the, the postbiotics. Um, and each department in this factory has a different job to do. And so there are there's one specific department comprised of these specific strains that we're going to get into here. Um, and their job is when you eat food, they trigger GLP-1 secretion. And so um, GLP-1 then has these benefits of helping you manage your blood glucose as well as reduce your food cravings. And so when we think about intermittent fasting, when you're not eating, your body is not naturally triggering GLP-1 because it's actually um, triggered when you're eating food. Um, that being said, it really points to kind of the mo one of the most important things that you can do if you're intermittent fasting is to be thoughtful about what foods you eat when you break that fast. And so um, eating, that's your sort of opportunity because you're sitting in this de deprived state where all of your microbes are sort of sitting there waiting for you to feed them the food that's going to, you know, trigger all these different responses. And so eating something that's high in fiber, high in polyphenols, feeding those beneficial microbes that are butyrate producers when you break that fast is a way to really jumpstart um, all these different departments in these particular, uh, in this particular factory, including the ones that help you stimulate GLP-1. And so Intermit while you're intermittent fasting, you're not stimulating GLP-1, but you have this very special moment when you break that fast of really um, jump-starting the GLP-1 response with certain foods. A couple questions regarding that study in particular. Do you happen to know if any people in, in the, the test subjects were on medications? 
And could there have been some sort of- Yes, um, most of the people in the study were on metformin um, and then some of them were on sulfonuria. Sorry, I don't know if I cut out there. Most of the people were on metformin, some of them were on sulfonurias, um, but that we would try to get people who were kind of not really on a lot of medications. Okay, and what about age range? Was there kind of a broad spectrum there or were they within a tight age range? Oh man. Okay. Well, you're testing my, my, my memory here now. It's definitely all the publications So somebody should fact check me, but um, these were all adults. So definitely everybody was uh, over 18. And I, I can't remember if we had an upper end cutoff of, of the age, but the, the, the mean age was somewhere around, I think 50 to 55, um, you know, kind of your, your typical, we were trying to go for sort of your typical age group that is sort of suffering from diabetes. Was then Yep, was got, yeah, one last question before we move on that was related more to the, to the fecal transplant side. Could someone's, some, can someone's thin person microbiome be someone else's obese person microbiome? Oh my gosh, such a great question. And uh, I think not too many people are excited to experiment with that just in case uh, you know, it all goes south. But I think that generally speaking um, in the, and, and there haven't been a lot of fecal microbiome transplant studies looking specifically at this question. But I think generally speaking, what we've seen in these studies is that um, a person with a, um, with a with healthy metabolism, when you transfer their, uh, do this fecal microbiome transplant into people with obesity or type two diabetes, they're seeing resolution of disease. And so it does seem to imply that um, there are certain microbes and certain microbiomes that probably have functions that work for a wide variety of people. Now, how long that lasts, I think we don't really know. Um, and then how the microbiome interacts with our genetics is certainly a place of a lot of exploration. We don't know that yet. But at the onset, just in these fecal transplant studies, it looks like that there is some kind of, um, and glo when I say global, these have been done around the world, um, beneficial impact with these particular microbes. Let's keep going. Lots okay. of questions coming in and we will try to get to as many as we can, but we'll just pause here every time there's a transition in the presentation for a few. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so really this is a, a pretty deep mechanism of action slide, which I'll, I'll take us through, but this is really focusing on GLP-1 production by the microbiome. And so if you look, I don't, can you guys see this when I use my cursor? Okay, so if you look at the top here, um, this is where two of the key strains are, Bifidobacterium infantis and Clostridium butyricum, and then we have Acromancy mucinophila here. So these are the three key strains that we're gonna talk about. Um, Acromancy mucinophila and Clostridium butyricum are the only two strains that have ever been published to date to show that they can stimulate GLP-1 directly. And so they're in here. And then Bifidobacterium infantis is in here because it works with these strains in order to help stimulate GLP-1. So um, Acromancia actually stimulates GLP-1 in two different ways. One is that um, it's able to produce short chain fatty acids, in particular propionate. And propionate um, can be converted into butyrate, which stimulates, which when butyrate binds to these G protein coupled receptors, GPR41 and GPR44, that stimulates L cells to secrete GLP-1. The second way that acromancia is known to help uh, stimulate GLP-1 is it secretes a protein called P9, and P9 binds to the ICAM2 receptors in the L cells, and that also stimulates the L cells to secrete GLP-1. Clostridium butyricum, as its name suggests, is a, is a big butyrate producer. And so Clostridium butyricum uh, can directly uh, produce uh, and secrete butyrate. And butyrate is a short chain fatty acid, which when it binds to these G protein coupled receptors, stimulates GLP-1. And then the reason Bifidobacterium infantis is a really interesting molecule to, uh, sorry, strain to um, add with these two is because it's able to produce both acetate and propionate. And these are short chain fatty acids, which can both be converted into butyrate. And so uh, B. infantis is a strain that we've included because of its ability Ability to work alongside Clostridium butyricum and Acromancia mucinophila. When these strains are in abundance in the microbiome and they're able to metabolize fibers into these short chain fatty acids and secrete P9, um, what you get is the secretion of GLP-1, which then uh, signals to the pancreas, the stomach, and the brain um, in three different ways that help to lower food cravings. And so Acromancia is a, we're gonna deep dive a little bit into this strain. Um, it is emerging as a keystone strain that's really important for your metabolic health. 
Um, it lives in the mucosal layer, and a healthy gut microbiome can be comprised of you know, quite a bit of acromancy mucinophila, and it plays a role in gut permeability. And so just to get right to the heart of the data that's been published to date on acromancy boosting GLP-1, on the left-hand side here, you can see images of cells that are secreting GLP-1 in green. And you can see that as you increase the amount of acromancia, there's a dose-dependent response of the amount of GLP-1 that is secreted. On the right-hand side here, um, this group is really trying to understand what is it that acromancy is doing specifically to increase GLP-1 secretion? And here in the top panel, they've taken a bunch of different fractions of acromancia, and they've shown that this P9 fraction or this P9 protein, which is secreted by acromancia, is the one that's responsible for stimulating GLP-1 production. And on the bottom, you can see that it's shown that uh, it does this in a dose-dependent manner. And so um, really a lot more, uh, my expectation is a lot more research will be coming out about how acromancia does this. But to date, we know that it secretes this P9 protein that stimulates GLP-1 um, directly. And so kind of in a cartoon version of, of acromancia, on the left-hand side here is what it looks like when you have an abundance of acromancia in the microbiome. There are three key things that I want to point out. One is the ability to produce propionate, which we've discussed. The second is the ability for acromancy to stimulate, uh, to secrete P9, which we've also discussed. Both of those stimulate GLP-1, which is responsible for weight management as well as blood glucose control. Acromancia also has a surface protein called AMUC1100, which is able to bind to these TLR2 receptors that plays a really important role in gut barrier integrity as well as immune homeostasis. And then one of the things that um, we know about acromancia that is kind of, it's, it's very unique property of acromancia is that it is able to um, regulate this mucin layer because it consumes mucin. So um, it is able to consume the mucin uh, in this mucin layer, as well as to stimulate goblet cells to produce new mucin. And so um, people have heard me uh, talk about this before, Jeff and Alex are probably sick of hearing this analogy, but um, this is sort of like a wooden fence, uh, which is held together by glue. So uh, in your yard, if you have a wooden fence, um, which I actually do in my backyard, these planks, these wooden planks are held together by glue. What can happen over time and through different weather is that that glue can start to weaken, planks can start to fall. And your gut lining literally has a, a very similar structure where you have these cells, which are the wooden planks, and this mucin, which is the glue. And acromancy is the only strain that we've discovered to date whose job is to sit there and strip away the old glue when it gets old and put on new fresh glue. And so it really plays an important role in maintaining the integrity of this gut lining, which many people know is super important um, just from a structural standpoint. And what happens when you have this thinning mucin layer on the right hand side here is that you lose lose these tight junctions, and that enables things like intestinal inflammation, this reduced gut barrier function, and even infiltration of pathogenic bacteria, which shows up in patients in a wide variety of, of kind of terrible symptoms. And so this is why acromancy has become known as a keystone strain. And so um, one of the first studies that was done looking at acromancia was in this American Gut Project. It's across 10,000, uh, more than 10,000 people ages 20 to 99 years of age. And what they showed in this uh, project was that um, higher levels of acromancia are associated with low levels of obesity. So if you have high amounts of acromancy in your gut, that's associated with low levels of uh, low risk of obesity. And that is independent of age, sex, smoking, alcohol consumption, diet, and country. It really appears to be this universal um, correlation. And then a follow, oh, sorry, never mind. Apparently we're not gonna do the follow-on to that study, but I will maybe just articulate it that one of the exciting follow-ons to that study is that um, they looked at people starting microbiomes and put everyone on the same diet. And they showed that people who had higher levels of starting acromancy in their gut actually responded better to diet. And so we think about like, why do some people respond better or worse to certain diets? It might just be your starting microbiome and your ability to actually, uh, um, uh, adapt to those diets better or worse. So okay. we, we, we put this slide here in particular because we knew there was going to be so much information in these slides that we were going to take a pause here. Lots of questions coming in. Um, you know, one in particular that I think is very relevant to address right now, probably on a lot of people's minds is we know with GLP-1 medications that they are essentially medications for life. Once you start taking them, you're essentially having to take them ongoing. Otherwise, the effects will wear off. What about 
supplementing with acromantia and with these kinds of strains, is this something that's necessary for the rest of your life or do you expect the changes to happen and then be sustainable? At a high level, if you can get these strains to colonize, you shouldn't have to take the product for the rest of your life. And so, um, you know, maybe just to point out one big difference between the, the drugs and then what we're talking about here is that the drugs are a, um, they're basically a, a chemical um, small molecule designed to mimic the body's natural GLP-1. And so you inject them directly into the bloodstream because they're a, a, a chemical, they're actually not recognized by your, your normal systems. And so they actually stay at a high level all the time and so normally you're, you eat, your GLP-1 goes up in, in your bloodstream and then it goes back down and then you eat again. And so you're supposed to have this sort of cyclical um, nature to GLP-1 in the bloodstream. But what these drugs do is they basically maintain GLP-1 at very high levels um, all the time. And, and that's so, so the two reasons that people have such dramatic impact when they go on them, like some people within an hours of taking their first injection already have uh, you know, feelings of nausea or they, they don't, they're not hungry anymore. Um, and then conversely, when you go off them, you have this sort of immediate rebound is because you are kind of in an unnatural way, supplementing your body with something at high levels um, all the time. And so in contrast to that, the, the microbiome intervention here is really almost like teaching your body to fish. So you're giving your body back these microbes um, and you're going to get this natural increase in lowering. So what that means is that you're not going to have this immediate after I took my first pill, I already feel you know totally different. But it also means that if you can get these strains to colonize, that you don't have to be on this product forever. And so some of the ways that you can get them to colonize um, were, were in Jeff's first slide, which is really thinking about you know um, diet and nutrition uh, and, and certain foods that are going to help you to, um, to grow these strains. Uh, and, and so um, maybe as a business, it's not a great thing for me to say, but the truth is that if you can just take these pills for, you know, let's say 90 days and modify your diet to colonize them, you don't need to keep taking them forever. Um, uh, this will address a couple people's questions um, and I'll kind of put them together. So, you know, the, it's really targeted around, is, is there a too much acromancia? So can a person have too much acromancia and then specifically, you know, if, if you're already picking that up, say on a GI map test, that they have high levels of acromancia, is it still beneficial to consider supplementation or, or should we th you know, think of more of the, the diversity and balance side of this? So this is a great question. And I'll sort of caveat by saying that we've not known about acromancia as a scientific community for, for so long now, maybe about 20 years, in contrast to some of these other strains that are on the market that we've known for, you know, 50 plus years. And so we're still learning more and more about acromancia. So I'll caveat with, you know, as of today, April 9th, 2024, this is what we know. And uh, we're learning more every day. What we know is that um, there are uh, people that have high levels of acromancia that um, can still benefit from getting more acromancia. And so um, there are, and maybe I'll, I'll point to, and I don't know if there's questions specifically around this, but there have been some interesting studies that have come out recently showing a correlation between things like multiple sclerosis and high levels of acromancia. And the reason this is super interesting is because um, the follow-on studies to that are really trying to understand what, what, why do you have this correlation between MS and high levels of acromancia? And there've been a couple of really interesting, now, these are all in mice, so I know that mice are not small humans, but this is the, the, the model system that people have been working in. There have been a couple of really interesting studies that were done uh, by a group, the, the, the Cox and Weiner groups over at Harvard MGH, where they've basically taken these mouse models of MS, and they've done these fecal microbiome transplants, and they've shown that they're able to um, reduce the symptoms of MS. And then furthermore, they actually supplemented these mice specifically with acromancia that they got from these stool transplants, and they were able to see resolution of the MS symptoms in these mouse models. And so one of the hypotheses right now is that somehow your body has a way to upregulate acromancia or to stimulate acromancia when it, you're trying to battle these inflammatory or immune diseases. Um, and so trying to understand kind of how our bodies interact with our microbiome and what are these feedback loops, I think is of you know, really great interest um, to, to a lot of people right now. And maybe one other piece of information along those lines is that 
there have been a lot of really great studies showing that polyphenols can actually have benefit for patients with MS. And one of the things we know about polyphenols is they boost acromancia production. So uh, this is still under a lot of study, um, but I think it's it's a really interesting um, uh, area to be in. One more quick one, and then we'll we'll keep going here. Um, follow on to the previous question is, I think logically it would make sense that if someone is taking or or is on GLP-1 agonist medication, that using these kinds of strains along with the interventions that were mentioned by Jeff at the beginning could be a way to wean them off of the medication. First of all, do you agree? And second of all, is is are there any trials that suggest that's even possible at this point? And then a quick follow on that is, what about if someone does have high acromancy levels, just focusing on the Clostridium butyricum to increase the, the level of butyrate? Yeah, so um, for the first question, you know, no, we haven't done any clinical trials or seen any that were done where people are trying to bolster the microbiome as a way to, um, you know, reduce or completely go off of these uh, GLP-1 drugs. I do think that um, there is a great interest from practitioners. So hopefully there's a bunch of people listening here today um, and, and also including um, uh, my colleagues here, Jeff and Alex, who are thinking about, you know, how do we best serve people um, who are trying to get the benefit of these GLP-1 drugs? And one could imagine a few different case scenarios. You know, one is people who, um, you know, have prediabetes or they, they really don't have diabetes yet, but they're trying to increase their, their GLP-1 production naturally. Um, one might be people who are really intrigued by the drug, but gee, they don't really want to be on a pharmaceutical. This is giving them a natural way to increase their GLP-1. There are people who actually have adverse reactions to the, to the drugs and can't really be on them for a variety of reasons. Those people might be great candidates. And then the last bucket here, which has been brought up, which is people who are on them, but maybe you don't want your patient to be on them, you know, for the rest of their lives. And maybe they don't want to be on them for the rest of their lives. Is there maybe a methodology for tapering them off? Or maybe there's even like a stop start where, look, even if you're on it, you know, once every, uh, you know, one fourth the amount of time, then you would be on it full time. That might already be a, a you know, beneficial outcome. So let's say you're on the GLP-1 drugs, you go off them for three weeks, and then you go back on them. You know, that might be the kind of a system that would be beneficial for somebody in the long run. Um, and so I think all of these, we're looking to you guys to help uh, us understand, you know, where the case studies were you seeing benefit I'd love to hear from you guys if, if you have any opinions about how you think about the microbiome um, alongside, you know, these other tools. Yeah, I, I mean, I to me, like it, it fits in that, you know, foundational view of, of, of diet and lifestyle. But I, I think, you know, yes, diet and lifestyle will help the microbiome, but I also think the ability to now have you know, acromancia supplementation to support all, all of the things we're seeing in the studies. You know, ideally, you know, if someone has to be on GLP ones, you know, because again, they, they've, they've got a, a medical condition that really needs to be addressed. Can we use a much lower dose? Or to your point, can we pulse those? So I think we're all still trying to figure out what, what that routine and regimen is. Um, at, at least I have a patient population who's motivated to be on the least amount of medications at the lowest doses to do that, you know, where I think in the conventional world, it's let's push as fast and hard as we can and, and, and get the success tomorrow. Um, so I do think we're going to work on that as, as time goes and it's happening, you know, right, right before our eyes. Yeah. And I would say ditto to that. The, the often the, the barrier to preventing someone from going the GLP-1 agonist route is speed, the speed with which they want outcomes, right? So I think in this case, why that question came up and, and why we posed it here is, um, you know, if there's a way to give them the speed while also working on the foundations that allows them to eventually reach that crossing point where they don't need a medication and they can instead maintain it through probiotic therapy or through diet and lifestyle, that's kind of the ideal. And we've seen that with other medications, obviously. Antidepressants would be a good example where sometimes they're critical for the immediate need and then you use them as a bridge while you work on the foundations. You know, if there were trials to substantiate that, I think we'd even have probably adoption in the conventional world where, you know, you could start with those agonists and then gradually shift people over to more of a diet, lifestyle, microbiome type approach. So just talking more in the practical sense of what is possible. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, and I, I think kind of understanding how 
nutrition pairs with the microbiome is, of course, of, of huge interest to all of us. And I was thinking about it like a car. Uh, you need good fuel and you need a top tier your engine if you want to have a high performing car and the fuel is really the food you put in your body and the engine is your microbiome and so really trying to think about those two things as, as very much paired with each other to have a high performing body and so um love love those answers and then the, the just real quick on the question about hey what if i'm high in acromancia but low in clostridium butyricum do i really want all of those strains or could i you know start to be a little bit more um specific about what i'm supplementing a hundred percent and i think that if you've got um, you know, symptoms that you're looking at in a patient and you have, you know, gut microbiome tests that seems to link up with those systems, uh, those symptoms, and you just want to be giving Clostridium butyricum, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, we actually offer just Clostridium butyricum on its own or just Acromancy on its own. This formulation is really a trio that works together. But um, as we think about like this as being a department uh, in a factory, you might have plenty of one of the type of factory workers and you just need, you know, one. And, and so I think it's a, that's a pretty sophisticated way to approach it. And so I would say certainly, um, you know, it's doable, but I, I might opt for trying first with a full formulation and then pairing back to individual strains to see if you still get the benefit. Okay. Are you guys kicking me forward now? Onwards. Okay. <laughs> um, Oh, this was the study. Great. So uh, in the study, people who started out with high levels of acromancy responded to diet better. Um, okay, so uh, Clostridium butyricum is the second strain that's in this formulation. Um, uh, as I said, its name suggests butyricum. It's a big butyrate producer. Um, it's actually been found in humans and, and animal intestines, which is human animal guts, um, as well as in the soil and in the water, um, and is known to support GLP-1 production. And so Clostridium butyricum has actually been studied for, for quite a while. And so there's a lot known about the benefits of Clostridium butyricum supplementation. This is sort of a um, cartoon image that summarizes all of the different things that uh, Clostridium butyricum is involved in, including the stimulation of GLP-1. Um, and then this is the, the published data showing that Clostridium butyricum can increase GLP-1. On the left-hand panel here, it's showing that in a dose-dependent manner, you can see increases in GLP-1 production, which is the y-axis, as you increase the amount of Clostridium butyricum. Um, and then on the right-hand panel here is a study showing that um, these short-chain fatty acids in particular are able to stimulate GLP-1. And that's really the mechanism by which uh, Clostridium butyricum increases GLP-1 um, secretion. Um, and uh, low butyrate production has been associated with a wide variety of indications. Butyrate is probably one of the most well-studied small molecules and its importance um, is quite widely known, uh, especially in, in metabolic syndrome. And then the last strain in this trio is, uh, so there's Acromancy mucinophila, Clostridium butyricum, and the third is Bifidobacterium infantis. Um, as its name suggests, infantis, uh, it has really been discovered in the infant gut microbiome. So um, it plays a wide variety of roles, but it, it's really been studied in its importance in the developing infant gut and the immune system. It's a primary fermenter, which means that it's able to produce uh, the short chain fatty acids, acetate and lactate. Um, and so just getting back to the mechanism here, these three bacterial strains have been shown to be able to stimulate GLP-1 production and really give your body the natural mechanism uh, to, to lower food cravings. So I don't know if you guys want me to keep going uh, here into the food craving study, um, but but uh, I see Jeff nodding his head. So um, this is a study in which we are really looking at in humans, what is the impact of taking this probiotic formulation on food cravings? And so we utilize the food cravings inventory, which is the diagnostic test for measuring food cravings. On the right hand side here, you can see sort of a little um, image from that test. It basically takes all these amazing foods that everybody craves and loves and asks you, how much do you crave these things on a regular basis? Um, and so we took participants um, and just as a caveat, this was an open label, not a placebo controlled trial, um, but we took these um, uh, several hundred participants and basically gave them this um, questionnaire at uh, baseline and then six weeks later. And so um, six weeks after being on the probiotic formulation. So they were on GLP-1 probiotic. They basically took one pill a day for six weeks. And then we uh, re-gave them this food cravings inventory test. And what you can see on the left-hand side here is the overall food, Oops, sorry. 
What you can see on the left-hand side here is that the overall food cravings for everybody um, went down. And moreover, that 91% of people had a significant reduction in their food cravings after being on GLP-1 probiotic for six weeks. And if you um, parse those people out based on their starting uh, point of food cravings, then you say, okay, if you have more food cravings in the beginning um, versus less food cravings in the beginning, how much does that change? So these are binned into four different bins depending on your starting food cravings. You can see that for people who started out with more food cravings, they actually saw a larger drop in their food cravings during the six week period. And so, um, and then the last piece to this is this food cravings inventory actually breaks food cravings down into the four major types of food cravings. Most people know exactly which bucket they fall into. So there's sugars, carbs, uh, fast foods, and high, fast, high fat foods. And so usually people kind of have one particular weakness. Some people have multiple, but what you can see here is that no matter which cravings people fall into, for all four of them, you saw a reduction in their cravings, the highest of which was for sugars. Okay, and so um, with that, what I'll just summarize is that this is sort of an exciting time in the microbiome because we are understanding its role in stimulating GLP-1 production. And now we have a tool for um, giving people back the specific strains which have been published to show that they can increase GLP-1 production. And the primary outcome we've been really focused on is the reduction of food cravings because of this nutrition pairing with the microbiome, we're really excited about the food cravings results because what that enables people to do is to make better food choices, to kind of get off of this bad wagon of, of making bad food choices and to get them into a better nutrition that's gonna help stimulate these microbes and be in this really virtuous cycle of eating foods that stimulate the right microbes in the microbiome that can help them stimulate their natural GLP-1 production. Awesome. So much valuable information. And fortunately, we still have about 20 minutes left here for questions. So I'm going to breeze through these next slides. These are meant to be practical pieces of information that allow you all to apply a lot of what Colleen shared just now and be able to put this into practice as quickly as possible. So first of all, first, oops, I'm having issues with the arrow as well. <laughs> um, first of all, wanted to announce that we are now sharing this protocol that was co-developed between Colleen's team and Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. If you don't know Dr. Kara Fitzgerald, please check her out. She's a wonderful educator in our space, um, is able to cover a broad array of topics and has done a ton of work in the microbiome space in particular. Um, a lot of great nuggets of information in this protocol itself. So first of all, the, the composition of the protocol is, as you can see, probiotics, prebiotics, polyphenols, omega-3 fatty acids, and then general nutritional recommendations, all of which Colleen covered in the presentation. You can access that protocol by scanning the QR code with your phone. It will also be available in our protocol library on the Fullscript website, and you can upload that to your template library in your Fullscript application. So specifically not calling out products here, and you'll notice in the entire presentation here that we're not talking about products, we're talking about ingredients but there really is only one product that combines the three ingredients, the, the probiotic strains that we've discussed today. So pretty intuitive once you get to the catalog. Second up is we want to remind all of you, if you haven't seen these already, that we have two existing webinars that we've done with Colleen and Colleen's team. Um, so please check those out as well for additional information about how to use Acromancia and other probiotic strains in clinical practice. We are uh, happy to launch here as well this awesome handout that summarizes the information about these strains that were discussed today that you can use for yourself as personal reference or you can share with your patients to help substantiate why you're using these strains, these kinds of products in your clinical treatments. It's a really nice layout um, of the different effects and, and um, uses of the various strains. So similar to the protocol, if you scan this QR code, you'll access the handout. It's not currently available in the Fullscript resource library in the Fullscript application. If you don't know about that resource library, be sure to check that out. We have over 300 handouts that you can use to substantiate your treatment plans. This one for now, we're only sharing with this group and then eventually we'll put it into the, the library, but you'd have to upload it to your library and then be able to add it to your treatment plans from there. And finally, we have landing pages um, that if you scan these QR codes, takes you either to the Emerson Ecologics website or to the Fullscript website. It's the same information, so either one works. Where you have all of the information uh, from the various webinars that we've done with Colleen and her team, a variety of resources that you can access, the protocols, links, handouts, 
and the like. So that's kind of the, the summary of everything in one place. So again, as a thank you for all of you for joining us today, you're getting exclusive access to this content for now before we share it with the general audience. But that's it for me in terms of application. Now we have plenty of time to act, uh, to review some of these questions. Unfortunately, we are at uh, question 67 right now in the queue. So I don't think we're going to get through all of them today. But what we try to do is answer as many as possible here and then answer as many as we can after the fact as well, which we'll share in the, the post webinar email. So Jeff, do you have any queued up right now? I've, I've got about 10 queued up that I, I want to make sure we cover. But why don't you jump in? Yeah. Yeah, no, perfect. So, so Colleen, the question is, is around sort of food and diet, you know, on both ends. So you mentioned polyphenols as, as a potential way to support acromancia in, in the gut, but just in general, speak to sort of diet recommendations that we should be making to patients to sort of maintain that, you know, the acromancia levels. And, and then on the other side of that, are, are there specific foods or medications that kill acromancia in the digestive tract? Um, yeah, great question. So there have been a, a variety of studies that have shown that if you can increase your dietary fibers, um, particularly soluble fibers, that that's been shown to stimulate uh, acromancia colonization, and then polyphenols uh, as well. So in terms of those high fiber foods, things like sunchokes, or otherwise known as Jerusalem artichokes, asparagus, um, the things in the green section, I think typically tend to be pretty good for those uh, dietary fibers. And then for polyphenols, um, things like cranberries and pomegranates, um, also dark chocolate and red wine. Uh, you know, I, I try to make sure I get enough polyphenols every evening. Um, but these are all great sources for polyphenols as well as fibers. And, and as I said, both of those have been shown to be able to stimulate um, acromancia production. There's some questions. I don't know if you guys have your favorite foods that you recommend for people. <laughs> I think you hit on it from my perspective. Yeah, I, I think the caveat there is giving the warning that many of those foods cause flatulence. So just making sure people know that when you increase things like Jerusalem artichoke, you're likely going to get the outcome on the other end, but it's beneficial in the long term, obviously. Um, a couple of questions came in here about testing. So some people were asking, do you need to test before you start using these kinds of products or these kinds of strains? And similarly, um, you know, is, is there any ideal testing that you would suggest to understand what kind of microbial balance there is if you want to see the impact of using these these strains over time sure um well uh, there are a lot of tests on the market now and i think ever expanding and i'll start by saying that these these tests are not kind of regulated and there aren't um uh you know standards and standardization on reporting uh that that have kind of come out i think that is going to happen but it's not quite there yet so just with those caveats around uh, microbiome testing. It's all relatively new. Um, I think if you are able to pair up symptoms with gut microbiome test results, that that could be helpful. I, I do think it's a little bit tricky to, I mean, even I, who spend a lot of time looking at microbiome data, looking at those test results and knowing what to do with them are two different things. And so it's not always obvious what to do with those test results. Um, in some cases, you might say, okay, well, well, I see that this person's low in acromancia, they've got metabolic syndrome, so therefore I give them the acromancia strain or formulation that contains it. I think a lot of people and a lot of practitioners are moving forward with microbiome solutions without necessarily feeling like they need to have those gut test results in order to try to go after the microbiome. And, and frankly, if you see results on the symptoms when you've given someone a microbiome intervention, you know, that might be the only thing that you really care about at the end of the day. And so I think a lot of people are, you know, not necessarily clear on how to use the gut test results. Um, and so don't use them to guide practice. They actually use the symptoms to guide practice. That being said, I do think that if you can get a patient to take multiple of these gut tests, um, over time, you can start to get a baseline for their microbiome and, and maybe start to see where there's changes that happen. Um, there's there's essentially two types of tests out there. One is a DNA sequencing based test, which kind of tells you, you know, if you're looking at a forest, what are all the different fauna in this forest? And then there are qPCR based microbiome tests, which tell you, hey, if I want to know how many four leaf clovers are in this forest, how many are there? And so if you're looking at, I will specifically want to look at how much acromancia there is, or you know, um, th these qPCR based tests can be maybe your your better tool. Um, and we've really uh, worked closely with. Um, the GI map a test to, to really look at, at the sensitivity and specificity of that. That's made by uh, DSL. And 
Um, I think my, my opinion is after looking at these different microbiome tests that there's, if you're specifically looking at the quantitative macromancia, um, appears to have the most sensitivity and specificity. All right. So another question, um, if a patient has had a colectomy or large or small intestinal removal, does the three strain regimen still work? That's a, a great question. And um, I don't know the answer to it from a clinical trial perspective, but I will say this, that um, the person who initially discovered acromancia is a bariatric surgeon from Harvard uh, uh, named Lee Kaplan. And so Dr. Kaplan was trying to understand this question of, well, when pe people undergo bariatric surgery, what are the big changes that happen? And, and discovered acromancia is a really important gut microbe. So um, that's all I'll say about that, because I don't think we know, but uh, it is, there's definitely an interesting connection there. A simple one is safety in pregnancy. Are there any concerns in using it for pregnant patients? We have not done um, clinical trials in uh, people during pregnancy. We certainly have customers who have taken it during pregnancy. And I actually think it's a really interesting place of field of study because um, actually, acromancy has actually never been found in any foods or beverages. Um, and so there's sort of this question of, well, where do you get acromancia from in the first place? And, and we know that people become depleted in it as they age. And um, one of the really interesting things is that you can find acromancia in mother's breast milk. Mm. So it's possible that this is where it all starts and that's where you get your seeding and then, um, you know, go from there. Quick follow on that, sorry, Jeff, is okay. has there been any testing in the, the vaginal canal? And is there any, any uh, transfer during birth? natural birth, not C-section birth. Um, yeah, I don't, I haven't seen those studies um, articulate kind of the transfer. Th those usually have been focused on the transfer of things like lactobacillus strains, particularly that are in the vaginal canal, um, but I haven't seen any on acromancia. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just haven't seen it. Yeah. So qu question on the, the impact of antibiotics on the microbiome. So specifically, you know, even just using amoxicillin as dental prophylaxis, um, or, uh, you know, another procedure, what is the, the impact? I probably would just elaborate on, you know, antibiotic courses for infections in addition to prophylaxis, but, you know, what is that impact? What's the recovery time? I know you touched on this on, on, on the, the podcast with Peter Atia, so we'd lo love to hear you talk about just sort of that impact. I think we've all sort of thought and assumed that we, we know what happens, but I think you give a really good answer to this. Um, well, yeah. So, so first of all, I, I love antibiotics. They have saved millions of lives. I'm not an anti-antibioticer. However, whether you're taking them prophylactically or for treatment, they all act in the same way towards your microbiome, which is essentially it's a nuclear bomb to your microbiome. Um, and, and it decimates your, your most of the microbes in there. And, and as a consequence of that, um, there's a couple of really interesting studies that have been done, uh, one of which that was actually one of the studies that got me um, interested in the space and starting this company is they looked at, um, this, this study came out in 2012 by Dr. Marty Blazer showing that um, they looked at 12,000 babies and they showed that infants who were on a lot of antibiotics were more prone to obesity and type two diabetes later in life. The Mayo Clinic has actually repeated this study and they showed that kids who are under two years of age who are on lots of antibiotics are more prone later in life to not just obesity and diabetes, but also things like allergies, asthma, ADHD. And really it all starts with you're kicking off life with a depleted microbiome because of these antibiotics and somehow they're never really able to recover them. And for anybody who's ever taken an antibiotic, it's very common to have GI distress associated with that. And, and, that, and that is believed to be because you're completely killing off your microbiome. Um, and then one of the other potential downsides is this Clostridium difficile infection, which, which some people may know about. Clostridium difficile is a strain that many of us actually have in our guts and it's no big deal, it's at low levels. But when you take an antibiotic that gets rid of all the other microbes, there are certain strains of this Clostridium difficile that don't get killed by the antibiotic. And now they have no competitors and they can start to divide and propagate unchecked. And when they get to high levels in the body, they make you super sick and actually ultimately it's fatal. And so this is another downside of antibiotics. And just so that we're not ending with me as a Debbie Downer, the upside to antibiotics is that you have killed your whole microbiome, but you have an opportunity to replenish with good microbes. And so if you ever go on an antibiotic, um, 
actually, that's the moment. If ever you want to clean up your act on your nutrition or try these uh, probiotics, this is the moment to do that because you are starting with, you know, a completely wiped out, you know, blank slate. And so this is the time to go on that fantastic high fiber diet, that plant based diet. And this is the moment to start to give yourself probiotics to kind of reseed the good microbes. Yeah, I've often heard from many patients, actually, that uh, when they go on antibiotics, their kind of lingering gut issues tend to resolve as long as they don't go back to the old habits that they were <laughs> doing before. So maybe that's justification for doing a quarterly antibiotic cleanse. No, I'm just oh boy. <laughs> um, I, a quick follow on that, though, just from a pr practicality sake, because a lot of people who are interested in this topic are, are likely going to be using berberine clinically for the, the blood sugar regulating effects, but berberine is also an antimicrobial. So is there any... There's likely not evidence for this uh, directly tying it, but is there any contraindication to using acromancy or any of these strains uh, combined with berberine? I haven't seen any. Now, we haven't done any studies with com combining berberine and acromancia, but certainly there's, you know, good literature supporting berberine's role in um, in glucose control. And we know a lot of people that are, are taking, you know, both the microbiome uh, intervention as well as berberine. I will say one of the interesting things about polyphenols that's been shown is that they also have a can have a mild antibiotic effect. And one of the hypotheses is that what these things like berberine and polyphenols are doing that's super beneficial is they're actually um, biasing the microbiome towards these more beneficial microbes by kind of having a negative impact on the, the so-called, you know, bad microbes. And so there's two, you know, this is an ecosystem. There's two ways to bolster the, the strains that you're trying to bolster. One is to feed them and to, you know, supplement with them. And the other is to get rid of the competitors. And so one of the things that berberine and polyphenols might be doing is to help bolster the good strains by eliminating some of the competitors. And so there's no reason to believe that these things don't act together. And in fact, there's evidence to suggest that they're, they're, they're beneficial when paired. Uh, I think we probably have time for one more, depending on on the on the answer. But I I, I think we're you know best to wrap up here. But uh, the question is, I, I see that there is a standalone acromancia at 100, one at 500. When would you choose between those two, or is the three strain one the better choice? It, it's probably the, the the question is more about what, you know when when should we choose between the different options that are available. So I think the protocols that we pointed to earlier can help people um, guide people to figure out in your particular uh, patient situation, you know, which product makes the most sense. The high low acromancy is actually a full script exclusive, so you can only get those through full script, and they were they're offered as a result of uh, practitioners asking for high versus low. And so some of the examples where somebody might use a low, the 100, acromancy 100 would be if your patient has a really sensitive GI, especially these encapsulations, they have an enteric component, which allows them to get through the stomach acid and they have a time delayed release, which allows them to get to the distal colon. And so some people are sort of sensitive to those capsules. And so you kind of want to, um, you know, load, low dose them in uh, with, with their acromancia. Um, and then for some people, they're depleted in acromancy and you're really just trying to give them this big bolus and jump start. And that's where the acromancy of 500 gets used. We were hearing from practitioners uh, and through through practitioners through full script that, hey, I'm giving people, you know, telling them to take four or five pills a day uh, in order to do this jump start. And we said, well, why don't we just make a product for <laughs> so that people don't have to take five pills a day. And so those are really the two case scenarios. And, and if you're trying to really go after these um, cravings and you're trying to go after GLP-1, then the three strain formulation. And, and if you're sort of uncertain about, well, gee, which strain is high or low, uh, I, I, I really am a fan of going after the full formulation. If you see beneficial impact, then you can start to pair back. Um, but if you don't see anything with a full formulation, there might be something else that is really at the heart of this person's uh, metabolic syndrome and cravings. Just to mention as well, there is a product that contains just the Clostridium butyricum in isolation as well, if you want to just focus on that and not focus on acromancia. So I think with that, we have to wrap up. Here's Amy. Just Hook in us time. off the page. Yeah. <laughs> with a hook. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much to everyone who attended today. And thank you also to Colleen, Alex, and Jeff for this great presentation.
One of our attendees today, Megan, shared that it's such a pleasure watching Dr. Colleen present. She is passionate and knowledgeable, and it's a joy to listen to her. And myself and the team couldn't agree more. So thank you so much, Colleen. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Anytime I'm feeling bad about myself, I'm going to come join this group. <laughs> Uh, everyone look out for an email with a link to view this recording and a special offer from Pendulum. Anyone who has any additional questions can send them over to me. And my email address is amy, A-M-Y dot Regan, R-E-G-A-N at fullscript.com. And I hope everyone has enjoyed this presentation and has a great rest of their day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everybody. That was great.